generally in engineering and biology, if you want to solve a problem, you go look in nature for a protein that already does something similar and then you modify it a bit. The relationship between sequence and structure has been really mysterious, but now we can actually design proteins with intent to do new things. So I think it's, it's just getting to be very exciting. Hi everyone, welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm your host, Kevin Scott, Chief Technology Officer for Microsoft. In this podcast, we're gonna get behind the tech. We'll talk with some of the people who've made our modern tech world possible and understand what motivated them to create what they did. So join me to maybe learn a little bit about the history of computing and get a few behind the scenes insights into what's happening today. Stick around. Hello and welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm Christina Warren, Senior Cloud Advocate at Microsoft. And I'm Kevin Scott. Our guest on the show today is Dr. David Baker. Dr. Baker is a professor of biochemistry and the director of the Institute for Protein Design at the University of Washington. His research group is focused on the design of macromolecular structures and functions. Yeah, I, I really do think that Dr. Baker is doing some of the most interesting work in the world right now. I for sure, like, I mean, with, without question, I would be choosing to study computational biology if I were a graduate student again today. It, it, it's just so fascinating what he's doing. I, and I can't wait to hear him talk about what he's doing and to hear the two of you interact. So let's chat with Dr. Baker. <music> Our guest today is Dr. David Baker. Dr. Baker is a biochemist and computational biologist who has pioneered methods to predict and design three-dimensional structures of proteins. He is the director of the Institute for Protein Design and professor of biochemistry at the University of Washington. Dr. Baker has received awards from the National Science Foundation, the Beckman Foundation, and the Packard Foundation. He's published over 500 research papers, been granted over 100 patents, and co-founded 11 companies. Welcome to the show, David. Thank you. Happy to be here. So for listeners who aren't familiar with your work, can you tell us a bit about the University of Washington's Institute for Protein Design and, and the work that you do there? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, in nature, proteins carry out essentially all the important functions in our bodies and in all living things. And they've come through billions of years, millions of years of evolution and sort of been optimized to solve the problems that were at hand during evolution. And what we've worked, figured out at the Institute for Protein Design is how to make brand new proteins and to design them not to address problems that were relevant during evolution, but to address modern day current problems. And that's really what we're focused on at the Institute. It's such cool work. And I'm, I'm interested how you got interested in the field. Were you interested in uh, science and math when you were a little kid? Were your parents uh, scientists or engineers? Like what sparked the interest that has carried you to where you are today? Yeah, it's interesting. I actually was not terribly interested in science as a kid, perhaps because my, my parents were scientists. And when I went to college, I actually did not initially major in science. I was initially a social studies major and then wanted to be a philosophy major. And then it was really my last year as an undergrad that I switched to uh, biology. And then I hadn't really done uh, research before, but I, I got really excited about what I had learned, uh, what I had been learning in biology, which was developmental biology and neurobiology. And so I decided I would try out graduate school to see what it was like. And I found I liked doing research and I liked, uh, you know, interacting with other people and sort of to solve hard problems. But as time went on, as I was a graduate student, then, then the next stage in my career, uh, postdoc, I got more and more interested in sort of more basic questions. And when I had taken my first biochemistry class, when I was a senior in college, they had talked about the protein folding problem. And it seemed really interesting, but everyone said it was too hard to work on. And so, but then when I, as a postdoc, and then really when I came to the University of Washington, that I decided to focus on, on trying to solve that problem. Yeah, I, I remember, um, I think in 1993, I was a research intern at the NCSA uh, oh, yeah. at, at, the, at the Beckman Institute, uh, working in the computational biology group that uh, Shankar Subramaniam uh, was running there at the time. And he was working on protein folding. And I remember how hard it was in 1993. So it, it's, uh, 
I mean, you, you, you picked a challenging problem to get inspired by. Yeah. Well, I always tell my students, people in my group, you got to pick, you have to pick hard problems that aren't solved. That's, that's the only, those okay. are the only ones really worth trying to work on. And, and so at, at that moment when you were a, you were thinking about being a philosophy major and you decided to switch to biology was, you know, was that a magazine article you read of uh, like an inspiring teacher, a movie you watched, a book, uh, like or just plain curiosity? It was, well, I think it was a little bit sort of um, getting fed up. I mean, I, you know, it started, I started realizing that more and more of those questions were sort of, you know, issues about language and language games and that there wasn't really, started seeming to me that there wasn't really a way to make consistent forward progress like discovery. I've always liked trying to discover things. And then when I took the biology class in contrast, it was there were just all these new discoveries right and left. People were just weren't working out how, you know, the principles of developmental biology. And it just seemed like this huge unexplored territory that was much more ripe for exploration than philosophy would have been. So you made the switch and you went to graduate school at Berkeley and uh, and UC San Francisco. And were how important was the computational part of biology when you were in grad school? Like, did you have to learn not just biology, but like a little bit about computer science or, uh, you know, wh while you were a student or did you have to learn that stuff later? Oh, yeah. Well, so I was a graduate student in the lab of, of Randy Shuckman, who worked on sort of cell biology, how proteins get moved, sorted around in cells. And at that time, well, I was famous and outspoken for ridiculing anyone who sat at a computer because, um, <laughs> you know, what, what people use computers for, they was pretty rudimentary, you know, it was kind of word processing and, you know, you could, you could waste time on computers the same way you can waste time on them now. So I, I did not do any computer programming and really my major, my major interaction with the computers, like I said, was to ridicule anyone who touched one. So, I, you know, in, in a little while, I, I really do want to get into like what's changed between uh, then and now, because, you know, I, I, I think we'll talk about soon how much of the work that you're doing uh, happens by influence of some sort of digital technology. Uh, yeah. it, it's still, I mean, like still the, the biology is what's driving, but, uh, but computers play a big role, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, we're we're probably one of the biggest users of computers in all of academia. So, yeah, which which is so cool. But so, um, what did things look like after you uh, after you graduated? Like, what did uh, what were you working on, and like, what did that stage of your well, career look see, like? At, at the end of my PhD, I, I sort of discovered how to recreate in a test tube of very complicated biological processes, the ones that were involved in in sorting these proteins to where they need to go in cells. And it seemed to me it was going to be a very long complicated process to sort of purify all the proteins out and figure out their mechanisms. And I had been getting interested in sort of more basic questions about, you know, the structures of proteins, which I really didn't know much about. And so then when I, for my postdoc, um, I went to uh, David Agard's lab at UCSF, and he studied um, uh, structural biology and protein folding. And the first day when I went in, there was this computer terminal on my desk. And I asked, what was that for? And he said, it's for computing. So then I had to kind of learn what that was. So <laughs> that was one of the things I did. But I do have another sort of funny story about that time, which is that whole area of the building was really devoted to crystal structure determination, determining the, the atomic coordinates of proteins. So one of the first days I was there, I went into the room where everyone was sitting at their workstations trying to trace a protein chain through an electron density map. And so I said, oh, can I try? So I, I said, sure. So I sat down one of the screens and tried to trace the chain through. And I remembered then that I have horrible 3D visualization capabilities. I was totally incapable of doing it. So everyone in the room turned to me and said, David, shouldn't you have checked out whether you're any good at this stuff before you went into structural biology? <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, that, that is funny. So maybe you could explain to the listeners a little bit about uh, what exactly that looks like. So like you get a protein, you try to crystallize it. Uh, like at the time you were shining a bunch of x-rays through it and sort of looking at the diffraction patterns of i mean like i'm, I'm probably describing that's right it no, you're absolutely right um but but so like that that's just an incredible amount of work just to figure out what uh what a protein looks like when it folds itself up right yeah yeah it's a lot of work and it's very difficult too because you have to coax the proteins to crystallize and i don't really i don't think i this is probably would be 
uh, it's probably not exactly how it was, but at some point around there, I decided I really wanted to learn how to predict protein structure from sequence so that you wouldn't have to <laughs> do all this <laughs> crystallography and chain tracing and all this stuff. But yeah. And, and yeah, so, so yeah. So, so like talk, talk about that a little bit. Like it's sort of a big leap, I, I guess, from the, this idea that you're using a bunch of scientific tools in the physical world to try to spy into the world of biology, much of which we can't see at all, um, you know, at, at this molecular level that you're, you know, that you're working at to trying to go from the sequence of amino acids and say, like, if I understand the sequence of acids, uh, like what, what is this thing going to look like and what a protein looks like dictates a lot of what its function is in the, in an organism, correct? Yeah, you're absolutely right. There couldn't be anything more different than the two processes which have the same end goal, which is each protein, each gene in our genome encodes a unique protein that carries out a unique function. And it does so because the DNA sequence for, in the gene encodes a particular sequence of amino acids, which then folds up into a unique three-dimensional structure. So it had been known since the 60s that the amino acid sequence of a protein determines its precise three-dimensional structure. But like you said, the way that people actually have been figuring out what the three-dimensional structures are, are is not reasoning from the amino acid sequence, but instead building hundreds of million dollar equipment and X-ray beams and all this complicated stuff um, to try and work out what the coordinates of the atom, where the atoms are. But all the information we know is in the amino acid sequence. And so then when I moved to the University of Washington, that was really the problem that I decided to focus on, like to, to really look at the simplest possible cases of protein folding and understand how they work and do that both with experiments to try and understand what the steps, what, what the process, the key, key aspects of the process were and what the determinants of protein folding were. And then on the computer to try and develop methods for actually going straight from the sequence to the structure. And so why is it important to be able to predict the structure of proteins uh, using a computer or any other mechanism. Yeah. Well, the same reason it's important to be able to determine the structure of proteins is because, like I said earlier, proteins carry out the essentially all the important functions in our bodies and in everything in life. And so if you want to understand how biological processes work or how disease comes about, you have to understand the interactions between proteins. And those are kind of, a lot of them are kind of like lock and key where things are fitting together very precisely. So you have to understand the geometry, how these structures fit together. And also if you want to understand how they work, like how they, how they generate, uh, they capture solar energy and convert it into formation of chemical bonds. All those things, you really have to understand the, the structures. In the same way that if you want to know how a machine that does any arbitrary thing works, you really have to know what it looks like. Yeah. So we, we may be at a really unusual point in time where people probably know a little bit more about like protein structure and uh, what its implications are than they ever had before because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, yeah. Correct. So you know, maybe in, in terms of SARS coronavirus too, uh, like, can you describe? Yeah, that's, uh, a, that's a great idea. Really good suggestion. In fact, now when I give talks, I explain protein design in the context of coronavirus. So let me just spend a couple minutes describing what we've been doing um, at the Institute with regard to coronavirus. So the genome sequence was determined and made available last at the beginning of last year. So we took that amino acid sequence and used the methods we've been developing to predict the three-dimensional structure of the protein on the surface, the spike protein. Of course, you're right. This is a, there's higher literacy about this now than there ever was. <laughs> and we knew that the spike protein bound the ACE2 receptor on the target cells. So starting initially with that model and then shifting over to the X-ray crystal structure when it was determined of the spike ACE2 complex, the first thing that we did was to design small proteins that we predicted would fold up into such a way that they'd have a shape and chemical complementarity to the part of the spike protein called the receptor binding domain that binds the ACE, binds ACE2. So these are like, I, I talked about sort of lock key interactions. So we, if you imagine the uh, ACE2 is the key and the RBD is the lock. So it's sort of the spike protein goes and binds to the ACE2, we basically made things that would compete away that interaction that is bind more tightly to the virus than ACE2. And we were able to make compounds that bind to the virus about a thousand times more tightly than ACE2. And these, this was really cool. They were just completely made up proteins, completely unrelated to anything that had been seen before. 
and with our collaborators, we're able to actually determine experimentally how these small proteins bind to the spike. And they bound, bound basically exactly like in our computer model. So we could then go, so that means we could go from essentially from the sequence of a virus to these very, very tight high affinity binding proteins. And the next thing we showed was that those proteins block the virus from getting into cells. And then we showed with collaborators that they protect animals from infection by the virus. And I think this was, this was kind of a real aha moment for me because we'd been developing these methods for designing proteins over the years. And here in the midst of a pandemic, we were actually able to uh, apply them to make therapeutic candidates. And those are, those are now headed for, uh, for clinical trials. It's been slow because this is a completely new modality, this whole idea of computational design proteins. So there's been a little bit of a pushback because these are completely new things. No one knows how exactly how they'll behave. But for the next pandemic, we're, we're going to be ready. So we have all the methods worked out. And we, I think we've gotten a lot over a lot of the sociological issues to actually using these as drugs. And there's nothing really that can be as fast if you can go from the amino acid sequence to actually computing a protein, which fits perfectly against the virus. So that's the first thing we did. The second thing we did was to de design, again, completely from scratch, little molecular devices that emit light, luminesce, when they encounter the virus. And those are pretty neat. We're, we're developing those now for um, not only for detecting the virus, but also for monitoring uh, responses to vaccination, like how, how good are my antibodies against the virus. And so rather than that being just like a fixed key that fits into a lock, that's actually a device that uh, can undergo changes in its state when it encounters the virus. And the third area, my colleague Neil King at the Institute has been developing sort of a next generation of coronavirus vaccines using designed protein nanomaterials that we've created at the Institute, which self-assemble into big things that look like uh, death stars. And we can put the um, parts of the coronavirus spike on the surface. And when Neil does that, it finds it gets very, very strong immune responses, stronger than with the current vaccines. These designed nanoparticle vaccines are now in clinical trials. So that sort of illustrates some of the key areas in protein design now, being able to design very precise shapes that can block, can bind very tightly to targets being able to design molecular devices that can undergo, that can basically do logic calculations and uh, being able to design nanomaterials like these protein death stars. Yeah, to me, this is some of the most incredible stuff that I've ever seen in my life. Uh, like, it, it's just amazing to me that you can go from a published sequence for this virus, simulate a, a, like a compound that has this incredible binding affinity to the RBD, like in this computational domain, uh, and then, you know, just be able to go from there to uh, like diagnostics, uh, vaccines, uh, you know, like potentially therapies, uh, like I'm guessing even that you could use these same techniques to try to assess uh, how effective a human antibody response might be to the variants of the virus. So yeah, in like, fact, yeah, that's we're, we're actually doing that now. Yeah, that's yeah. You know, it, it sounds kind of science fictiony to me. To to you, to you, it also still sounds that way to me. Which is why I mean, this field has been moving so fast. We've been able to make so much progress. So the things we can do now. That still are a lot of work, but I, I don't think I would have thought would be possible just even, you know, several years ago. And that's what's been exciting. I mean, people always ask me to predict the future of the field. And I always say, well, my biggest hope is that it will move so fast in such new directions, I can't predict it. And and that's actually what's been happening pretty continuously. So. Yeah. And so what are what are the big things that are moving progress forward right now? Like what what is just, I mean, and like you can sort of take a long view, right? Like I think yeah. the the landscape was very, very different when you started than it is now. Yeah, like what's totally different. Thing, what what are the big things that have there, there are just there's so many things that are coming together. And I think when you have technological revolutions, um, that's that's generally what's happened. There's just been a lot of things that come together, and you know I think our, we just happen to be at the right place at the right time. So what are they? Well, our understanding of the basic principles of protein folding have been improving over the years, and we've been developing this computer program called Rosetta to model these for um, for 20 years now. So there's been we've been doing a lot of work and sort of trying to get more and more of the details right. Second is uh, computing power. These things are, despite my ridiculing people <laughs> when I was a graduate student, these calculations now are, these, these systems are really complicated. And the basic principle is that proteins fold to their lowest energy states. So if you want to design a sequence that folds to a new structure, then um, you have to do, you have to search through this huge landscape and it's very time consuming. So the fact that computers have just gotten more and more powerful continuously is really 
opened up. And we couldn't have not have done what we did for coronavirus in that amount of time with computing even of 10 or 15 years ago. And the third that's really um, completely independent is that because of the genome project, there's been this huge advance in gene synthesis technology. So we design on the, we, on the computer, we can compute, you know, millions of different possible proteins that are, you know, all possible creations, but to actually bring them into the lab, we need to encode them in synthetic pieces of DNA, synthetic genes. And after we do that, we can put them into uh, microorganisms who will then produce them. But synthesizing DNA is still expensive, but it used to be hundreds of times more expensive. And so now we can routinely uh, design 100,000 brand new proteins for all kinds of different applications. I mean, the range of things we're doing now in the group, you know, trying to degrade plastic, trying to capture solar energy, um, trying to do exotic chemical reactions, all, all sorts of things. You know, this just would not have been possible, again, with the technology of 15 years ago. So the, being able to manufacture DNA very rapidly and cheaply is really enabling us to move forward quickly. And these things all go together because since we can compute, since we understand the principles, we can compute very large numbers of designs because we can manufacture so many genes, we can then bring them all to life. And then we can do measurements to see which ones work and which ones don't. And then we can fold that back in to improve the methods. And that brings up a, the fourth thing that's coming in, which is deep learning. And, you know, deep learning has just advanced by, you know, in the last 10 years has just in, been incredibly, has, has advanced as fast as the, as the other areas, if not faster. And so now we're complementing the Rosetta picture folding, which is sort of this physical model where you have this protein chain folding up with more of a deep learning approach, which is basically looking for recurring patterns and relating sequences to structures using those. And that's turning out to be very, very powerful. We can also use machine learning to try and interpret, to basically relate all this data that we're collecting to improving the computational models. And the fifth thing that's happening is that for the first time, these de novo design proteins are being developed as drugs. So there were probably four or five different proteins that we've designed, which will be in clinical trials this year. And so it's, we're kind of at this inflection point in all these different areas. And so, you know, we don't really know how they'll turn out, but if, if one or two of them, you know, actually work pretty well, then you can imagine that, I mean, we'll have de-risked this whole kind of platform. And I think that the thing is that the way engineering and biology has worked up until now is not intentional in this way. You, you, if you want to make a drug that binds to something, you either just screen a huge random library of compounds or you try and coax an animal to make an antibody against it. There's no, uh, generally in engineering and biology, if you want to solve a problem, you go look in nature for a protein that already does something similar, and then you modify it a bit. The relationship between sequence and structure has been really mysterious. But now we can actually design proteins with intent to do new things. So I think it's it's just getting to be very exciting. There's so much that you, you just said that I, I find fascinating and I want to follow up on. But like one of the things that, as a computer scientist, that wasn't super obvious to me um, as I started diving deeper into biosciences is the extent to which you are, we're, we're now at this point where you can actually use uh, biological machinery to go do work. So like it, what, what you just described a minute ago is you want to synthesize a protein, but you don't synthesize the protein by like having some 3D printer that just lays out a bunch of amino acids. Like you program a little piece of genetic material to use the cellular mechanisms that turn DNA into, into the protein that you want. And like, that's sort of like, that's just fascinating to me that like, we understand enough about some of the basic biological machinery that you can leverage that to do some of the work for you. Yeah, you know, I left out, there's a sixth thing I should have added to my list, which is exactly what you're saying. The whole recombinant DNA protein expression thing, our advances understanding basic biology, which we play a lot of, we use biology right and left when we're, when we're making these proteins and then we're screening them for activity. So you're absolutely right. That's another thing. It's like all of these different technologies have come together. Yeah. And so I'm, you know, one of the things that you, uh, you know, that you described is, the the end state of this is uh, de novo drugs, uh, like being able to design therapies for diseases like COVID-19 and like in the limit, like what you would be able to do, uh, what you'd like to be able to do you know, for cancer therapies, for instance, is you would like to be able to look at like the very specific yeah. uh, cancer mutation that you have, uh, like making someone ill and be able to custom tailor uh, a therapy to 
like the very particular illness uh, that you have. Uh, and in order to like, there's sort of two axes that I think are interesting. Like one is upper respiratory viruses are probably a little bit better understood than cancers. Uh, but like the trick with them is like, you need to go very fast. Uh, so you need to go from new virus to, you know, therapeutic for it to drug that you can start delivering. Uh, and like the amount of time that that takes yeah. uh, dictates like how bad, uh, you know, a, a public health crisis you're going to have for custom tailoring a therapy to an individual like what you're trying to drive down is cost uh so like we we have some of these therapies right now but it may legitimately cost a million dollars uh to synthesize the treatment uh just because it's very complicated and you know you you have five people who have the sickness a year so like do you see both of those things getting better so like time to you know, deliver a therapy or like the cost of delivering a therapy or are those both getting better? Or yeah, I think um, there's also um, the precision of the therapy. So you brought up a, a number of really good points, but one of the issues with current protein drugs, which is why they're so expensive, is they're antibodies. They're very complicated proteins. Antibodies are what we make to defend ourselves against disease. And so naturally in the sort of spirit of sort of emulating what's in nature, when pharmaceutical companies want to solve a problem now, they try and make a new antibody, and then that's the drug. The problem with that is that antibodies are very expensive to manufacture, and so that contributes to the high cost of these small, these proteins that we design, in contrast, can be can be manufactured for a hundredfold lower cost. They can be made in bacteria, not in complicated mammalian cells, which are much more sensitive and much more difficult to grow. As far as precision goes, antibodies, the way they work is they're kind of blunt instruments. They hone in on a target. They're, they're basically just, they're like the coronavirus binder I described. They just bind. We can, with design protein, we can actually design uh, logic systems that actually can go into the body and uh, pick out cells that have combinations of proteins on their surfaces that are indicative of disease. Because in some cancers, there isn't really a single distinguishing mark. There's a number of things, there are some things that are higher and some things that are lower in abundance than they would be in normal cells. And you need to be able to um, resolve those differences. And so you need more sophisticated types of, uh, more sophisticated drug, one that, like I said, can sort of do logic calculations in the body to really approach that. And in terms of time, you know, we're not there yet, but since everything's going on in the computer, then in principle, the, the reaction time should be much faster, say to a new pandemic, than it is if you have to. So with the antibodies, the antibody therapies for COVID-19, they weren't designed on the computer or designed by anybody. Instead, there was a lot of searching after and in, in the bodies of people who had been infected with the virus or animals uh, for antibodies that happened to bind to the virus and really be effective at blocking it. And it's pretty rare that you find those antibodies. So if you can design things by intent, I mean, it's kind of like the way that bio biological drug discovery and engineering has worked. It's sort of like you're trying to build a building. You keep throwing a pile, of, you know, bricks into a pile, and you hope it assembles into a building. Well, it's much better if you have if you understand the principles of construction and can just build it. So, so I think I think the future will be very bright. Yeah, and I'm just always reminded how complicated these biological systems are. Like yeah. things are very rarely as neat, uh, you know, as you as like a computer scientist or a mechanical engineer uh, have like you, you, you think, you know, like I, I will say for myself as a computer scientist, like I often think that I'm dealing with complicated systems, uh, but compared to biology, like our artificially engineered uh, digital systems that we're building are like nowhere even remotely as complicated as a biological system. Yeah. One of the things is, is uh, you know, I think we've all looked at these vaccines as you, you have two types of vaccines now that are prevalent. You have sort of the mRNA vaccines that we are very excited about and you have things that are look more like classical vaccines. So they have a, they use a, uh, like something like an adenovirus uh, to carry the, the spike protein into the body to try to produce an immune response. But like one of the funky things about adenoviruses, right, is uh, like if you already have antibodies for the adenovirus itself, like the antibodies may swarm in and, and kill the vaccine yeah. before it can produce uh, like the, the new immune response. So, I mean, I'm just sort of wondering, yeah, one, one of the things that you said that's really fascinating to me is like, I think we very quickly, um, you know, especially by classical um, 
vaccine development standards went from the genetic sequence of this virus to uh, like vaccines or therapeutics. Like you, you know, how, how long did it take you to design this thousand X binding thing? Once you had a sequence, like a month, two months, it was probably, it was probably, um, it was a few months, but that was because we hadn't done it before and we had to sort of learn by doing. And I think now we're working on methods for really doing that. What we'd like to do is be able to do that within two weeks. So the sequence yeah. of a new pandemic threat comes out. And then two weeks later, we have a really high affinity antidote. That's aspirational, yeah. but I think it's possible. Yeah. And, and like, you know, everything that I've seen uh, seems what, like, you know, far better than I do, but like, it's, it sounds like a reasonable aspiration uh, to me. Yeah. Like the thing that I don't understand as well is then the hard part starts, which is trying to assess the safety of the thing yeah. that you just synthesize. And like, that's, you know, even with the mRNA vaccines that we, uh, that we made, like, we had a pretty good idea that they were going to work. Uh, like we just didn't know that whether or not they were going to be yeah. safe. Yeah. Um, and so how, how do you, I mean, like, can we use the techniques that you are describing to like do some of that safety assessment to drive the, you know, the, well, the what we can do. Yeah. It's a really good question. And that is probably one of the biggest question marks currently. So what we can do is on the computer design in properties that we think will correlate with safety but humans are very, very complicated. So it's hard to predict exactly what will happen. And so I think that is evaluating safety is the thing that is slow. And that actually is what has been taking all this time much longer than, than the design. So it's a good question. And there, we'll just have to learn from experience, I think. But so, so what are you most excited about uh, over the next handful of years? And like, what do you think we as, uh, you know, like citizens, uh, like folks who are very encouraged by what you're doing, who want to like help things go faster? Like, what can we do to like get some of this goodness that you're building, like moving yeah. faster? Well, let's see. So we have, um, we we're I've been very interested in involving the general public and scientists at large in what we're doing. So we have an online game called Fold It, where uh, we post a lot of the current problems we're working on. For example, now one of the Folded puzzles is that we've designed small proteins which bind to different parts of the coronavirus, and now Folded players are being challenged to connect them in just the perfect way so you get sort of the much stronger binding. So Folded is one way, and then we have a project called Rosetta at Home, which is how we do a lot of our computing. If we, we send out jobs to people's computers and they compute new design proteins and send them back, and then we select from those which ones to make. So those are two of the ways in which um, people can get involved in, in what we're doing. Yeah, and like in my opinion, like that's a much more beneficial thing for like our collective human well-being than uh, like using your spare GPUs to do uh, cryptocurrency mining, uh, for yeah, instance. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, you know, j just in terms of your work, uh, like, what are you really excited about uh, over the next handful of years? Like, how, how do you prioritize your energy among, like, all of the many, many, many things you could go explore? Well, um, one of, there, there was, there's a magic ingredient to all of this, which I haven't really talked about yet, but that's part of the answer, which is that the most brilliant people in the world, graduate students and postdoctoral fellows are now coming to the Institute for Protein Design to sort of push the next wave of discoveries and make their fortune and, you know, start out exciting new independent careers in this area. So what I actually do every day is I talk to these absolutely brilliant people in my group about, you know, we new people come in and, you know, we sort of brainstorm different ideas. They go and talk to everybody. I have sort of a theory of scientific creativity this idea of a communal brain where if everyone's talking to everybody all the time and like connected neurons, you can get these really emergent things. So in terms of the new areas that we're going into, there's really, it's very wide and it's driven in part by the interests of, of people come in. But some of the really exciting areas are, well, really sort of pushing ahead on this very rapid therapeutic design, making better vaccines, biological machine, you know, designed machines, nanomachines that can do work and, um, for example, uh, you know, we're making rotary motors now, trying to couple them to energy sources. We're really excited about making new types of materials. So in nature, there are things in nature, we have examples like bone and tooth and seashells where it's proteins interacting with inorganic compounds to create all sorts of, you know, hybrid structures. And I think that's a really rich area. What if those things that you were interacting with were semiconductors rather than, you know, calcium carbonate, you could, you know, the sky's the limit there catalysts, you know, trying to catalyze chemical reactions, which don't exist. 
We have a big effort now in exploring molecules that really nature couldn't explore because they're made out of more exotic stuff than just the 20 naturally occurring amino acids. So new, new classes of compounds, we can take the same computational methods we've been developing and apply them well beyond outside uh, proteins. And we're making systems that are, can to sense the environment, uh, respond. Um, you know, I could go on and on. <laughs> I'm excited about it all. <laughs> Well, and, and it and it is sort of super exciting. And like going back to the intro, like your your bio, like you started, uh, you co-founded eleven companies. And so, you know, I, I think beyond the yeah you know, the fact that this is all scientifically some of the most interesting stuff in the world right now, and it has this huge potential for you know impact in the same way that great scientific discovery usually does. Like you also are like at the epicenter of this new entrepreneurial engine. So like yeah. you're st- like in, in a lot of the ways, like Silicon Valley, uh, like you go to a Silicon Valley school and, you know, like a bunch of the professors there are starting companies and like it's this vibrant ecosystem. Like I'm really excited and uh, to see this happening with what you're doing. Uh, yeah, that's a really important part because I told you with all these many, you know, brilliant people um, in their 20s are coming here to do great things. Many of them, it used to be they all wanted to go on and be professors. Now many of them come with the idea of starting companies, and many of them are doing that. I mean, I think we'll probably be spinning out three more companies this year, um, and it's just it's sort of accelerating. Uh, there's there's so many different things that proteins can do, um, and uh, and that's great because it is creating this whole new ecosystem. It's people, and you know, the people who don't want to start companies or um, take faculty positions instead are taking jobs at these companies and uh, the companies can then really go much deeper into the various application areas. We're kind of like a discovery engine, the Institute for Protein Design, um, but then actually bringing things out in the real world is a, is a whole nother, you know, effort. And so that, that's, um, that's what our spin out companies are doing. Yeah. And then I also really have to thank, you know, uh, the, the reason you didn't really touch on this, but what's really also fueling this is, is philanthropy because, you know, what we're doing is so new, it's almost impossible to get grants to do this. And so a lot of a, a large fraction of our work is supported by, uh, by private philanthropy, people sort of see this as that this really is the, you know, a technological revolution, and that pushing it forward rapidly will, you know, lead to all kinds of great new things for society. And we're really completely indebted to the people who are supporting our work. Yeah, which I, I, I wish we could channel more funding like if i had a magic policy wand to wave like i would you know 10x 100x the level of collective investment from philanthropy to government funding to corporate funding that uh that was happening with this stuff uh like the return on those investments uh both financially and in terms of you know goodness for society like you know better health care for us all for yeah. instance like i think it's just tremendous yeah so well, what's what would be your advice to students who are thinking about this as a career path? Like, what should they study? What should they learn? It's It seems very interdisciplinary to me that, you know, it's chemistry, biology, computer science, entrepreneurship. It's like just a bunch of things. I would say be a generalist is, I mean, that's what you can sort of see from my trajectory. <laughs> it's, it, um, there's not, you know, the tech, this field is changing so fast that even if you were an ex- expert in protein design today, you know, five years from now, you would probably have to relearn everything. So, yes, yeah, so I think getting it's exactly the said. There's biology, there's physics, there's computer science, there's some sociology. You know, we live in the world. And so I think it's important to, um, yeah, to, to get a broad education. And, you know, and actually, when I look back at, at my own education, it's, for a long time, I thought that, well, what, what the hell does social studies or philosophy have anything to do with what I do now? But actually, it's turned out to be very, very useful in a lot of ways. So anyway, so I think that's in terms of a broad education. And then, you know, to actually, if you actually want to start doing this kind of work, being uh, joining a research group where um, in some capacity where this where such work is going on is really there's no substitute for that. Yeah. Well, so we're, we're almost out of time here. Um, the, the last question I like to ask everyone, uh, and it's a weird question because everyone I chat with has such interesting work that they're doing in their professional lives. But I'm always curious what you do for fun or what you find interesting outside of your professional life. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, I love the mountains and are just going out, getting away from things, I, you know, whether it's on the water or in the kayak or climbing or skiing or hiking. Um, it's really what I love to do. I, during the week, there's a lot going on and a lot coming in and I need a little, and having time just out in open space to process 
every once in a while is is really great. So it's yeah, and and you live in the Pacific Northwest, like yeah. one of the most beautiful places in the world uh, to be outside hiking or biking or kayaking or whatever you're. That's right. That's right. And that's 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 part of the reason I'm here. So yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, th this is amazing. Like, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Uh, and more, more importantly, thank you for what you're doing. Uh, like, I don't know whether you think about uh, your work as like this great public service, but it very much is. Uh, and so on behalf of many of us, like, I, I just want to express real appreciation and gratitude for, uh, for the work that you and your students and your colleagues are doing. Well, thanks, Kevin. This was a lot of fun. And um, honestly, what I, I'm not a surfer, but I just feel like we're riding the wave and we want it. You know, the longer we can ride it, the better hope and we can make the world a better place. That's yeah. really the, what we're trying to do. So, yeah, this was a lot of fun. I enjoyed our conversation. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. Well, that was Kevin's conversation with Dr. David Baker. So what stood out to me about your conversation was just how fascinating everything that's happening in this field is. Like, I honestly, I'm going to be honest with you, even after you said that this is what you would study in grad school, if you were in grad school right now, I, in my mind, I'm like, I'm I'm not a, a traditional sciences sort of person. I don't know how fascinating any of this will be. And I'm just riveted by all the cool stuff that is happening in this space. Yeah, it's really crazy, like how fast things are moving right now. You know, I think one of the things that he said that was really interesting and very, very true is that scientific revolutions, technological revolutions tend to happen when you have multiple things that are moving very quickly and have had their own transformations come right. together at the same time. And he, you know, named off six of those in the course of our conversation. And yeah, it, it, it's one of those places where because it's moving so rapidly and because every day we're learning more and more and more about how to push things forward even faster, this is just where so much of the interesting things are going to be happening in the world over the next couple of decades is in this particular discipline uh, in digital biology, synthetic biology, computational biology where we, we really are trying to get this like high resolution and more accurate picture of what happens in biological systems and then being able to engineer those systems to solve yeah. really, really tremendous problems. Yeah, no, I mean, that's what struck me. I mean, like you said, you was talking about how all these different things kind of need to coalesce to have this real innovation. And when he was saying that some of the stuff that, that the industry has been doing and the, the scientific community has been doing with coronavirus wouldn't have been possible with computers from and technology from a decade or, or 15 years ago really struck me. And when he was talking about how the way that the engineering and the technology is working now is that it's intentional, whereas before, you know, you'd look to nature and now you are intentionally and having this intentionality about saying, these are the problems we want to solve and we're going to engineer a solution rather than looking for something that might already exist that can solve that problem. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it in a very real sense, like m many of these areas in biology now have a real engineering discipline that goes along with them in addition to the normal scientific practice. Like we understand enough about the systems where we can start designing them in ways that serve purposes that are different than the ones that nature strictly designed them for through the process of evolution. And like, to me, that is the most fascinating thing. And I, I think, you know, the, the interesting, interestingness about this particular moment is we are all at a heightened level of awareness about both the upside and the downside of biology because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Like we know what one little molecule can can do to impact hundreds and hundreds of millions of lives uh, and, you know, just sort of trillions of dollars worth of economic damage. And like we also know that we can harness this greater understanding that we have about biological systems to in an unprecedented way design therapeutics and vaccines for uh, for the pandemic itself and like all of that just gets better uh, in the in the future it, it does and it makes it exciting I mean it make it's 
a little bit harrowing in some senses. And if you wanted to become really dystopic about it, it could be, you know, sort of concerning in that respect. But it's also so exciting because it really does feel like the things that we've thought about in the past of being science fiction are really going to be things that not necessarily, right? Like that actually could be reality, which is, I'm going to be honest, I think if nothing else, I mean, I think it's exciting, but if, if nothing else, it's really interesting. Yeah, I I, I do think it's exciting. Uh, you know, I keep saying that I'm an optimist, even though yeah, my my wife would look at me and say I'm a grumpy, uh, grumpy old cynic. But I, I'm I'm very optimistic about the choices that we will make about how these tools and this greater scientific understanding of biology will get used. Like our, and I and I think you can absolutely see it with uh, you know with COVID nineteen. Um, like we we have just had our scientists and engineers come together in exactly the way that you would hope to like just pour time and energy and expertise into getting us past the misery of a global pandemic as quickly as possible. And, and I think not just the science has been a shining light, but the way that we've come together as a species uh, has been a shining light for me. I agree. I agree. It's actually been pretty remarkable to see and to see what's happened in this relatively small period of time, all things considered. Anyway, this is a great conversation. I love hearing about what Dr. Baker is working on in his work. That's it for our show today. We are so grateful to Dr. Baker for joining us. And you know that we love hearing from our listeners. So contact us anytime at behindthetech at microsoft.com. Thanks for listening. See you next time.